Uh, okay, you will start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome again to the CCE 2022. And we will continue with the, the next plenary lecture. It will be given by Professor Daniel Ulises Campos Delgado from the Instituto de Investigaciones y Comunicación Óptica from the University of Autónoma de San Luis Potosí. The, the chair of this plenary lecture uh, is Professor Daniel Melchor Aguilar, who is now at the IPC in San Luis Potosí also, and he will, take, uh, uh, he will uh, guide this uh, plenary lecture. So, thank you. Thank you, Gerardo. Uh, okay, we will start. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Daniel Ulises Campos Delgado. Uh, let me give some uh, details of uh, his biography. Uh, he received the bachelor degree in electronics engineering from the Autonomous University of San Luis Potosí the Master of Science and PhD degrees in Electrical Engineering from Louisiana State University. Since 2001, he is uh, in the Autonomous University of San Luis Potosí. He has published more than 80 uh, scientific journal papers and around 100 international papers uh, in Congress. His research interests include uh, estimation and detection, control theory, and digital signal processing. Um, he has received uh, several uh, international funding with the University of California, for example, Texas A&M University, among other uh, institutions and fundings. He is currently a member of the Mexican Academy of Science and also a senior member of the IEEE. Uh, Dr. Campos is actually the director of the Research Institutes of Optical Communication here in San Luis Potosí. Uh, he is an associate editor from IEEE Latin America Transaction and also for Communication Theory in Frontiers, Communication and Networks. So uh, thank you, uh, Daniel, for accepting uh, to give this talk. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Melchor. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And first of all, I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me for this plenary lecture. It's for me uh, an honor to present uh, some of the work that we have done 
in the Universidad Autónoma de San Luis Potosí. I just want to check, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank you, thank you. So let, let, let me start. The, the title of the, of the talk is called Hybrid Classification Approach for Correlated Multimodality Images uh, Biomixing Processing and Artificial Intelligence. Let me start saying that this is an effort of almost 10 years of work uh, here in the university. And I want to stress, this is not a work or just my group. Uh, this is a collaborative work uh, with some partners and other institutions. This is multidisciplinary work, and I want to acknowledge that. Uh, we have partners from the same university, Universidad Autónoma de San Luis Potosí, Universidad de Aguascalientes, from Spain, the, um, from uh, United States, from Italy, and I want to also thank my students who are always committed to do the work. The content of the presentation, it, it, I will start first uh, defining what is this term of correlated multimodality images. Then I'm going to present this hybrid classification approach that we have de developed in a group. And I'm going to show you some application examples where we have successfully applied this methodology of classification. And finally, I'm going to conclude with some ideas of future work. So uh, le let me start. Maybe this is not a common term, um, these correlated multimodality images. So I want to start first with a just simple definition. This correlated multimodal imaging uh, relates to combine different uh, e uh, techniques to capture complementary properties from a sample or from a scene. For example, capturing a spatial and a structural, a spatial and dynamical, and a spatial and a spectral. So with this modality, you can capture, as I was saying, a spatial and temporal, spatial and spectral, or a spatial and morphological properties of the scene. And uh, uh, we will get, we're going to have then a multidimensional image to work. And um, examples of this type of images are plenty uh, in, in application. The first one is multi and hyperspectral imaging. Maybe some of you have uh, uh, heard this term, especially in uh, remote sensing. And the idea here is you have uh, an image where in each pixel you have the reflector's response of, of, the, of the sample. In multispectral imaging, we have just a finite number of bands where we capture this spectral response and we have hyperspectral imaging you have uh, maybe hundred or thousand of bands uh, this this uh, this um, hyperspectral and multispectral images have been successfully applied uh, in um, uh, agricultural and biomedical and many many fields and this is one type of of this uh, images that we are studying. Another one is optical coherence tomography. In this technique, uh, over the surface of the eye, we capture the information of depth, especially the morphological pattern uh, of, of, of the retina in the eye. So we can reconstruct this kind of uh, three-dimensional arrays where uh, we can identify some uh, uh, problems with the layers in the eye and uh, this is very useful for physicians. Another type of um, these images is uh, fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy or FLIM. Uh, in this application, uh, an uh, ultraviolet laser excites uh, a sample and uh, what we capture is the fluorescent decay in response to this ultraviolet uh, laser and um, the idea is the molecules um, eventually is going to react to this uh, 
excitation according to the type of molecule and the um, uh, the concentration. And with this information, we are able to achieve what is called uh, optical biopsy. If we do this, if we capture this information in several bands, what we have is multispectral multispectral flame. Okay. Another type of uh, these images is uh, pulse infrared thermography. Uh, in this application, we have a sample, and this sample is heating is heated by uh, by a lamp. And then what we record is the temperature profile after uh, the, the heating is removed. So we are measuring the cooling of the sample. For that, we use a thermal camera. So we have a special information, but besides that, we have the temporal uh, temperature profile of the sample. And finally, we have this also multispectral video sequence. In this case, we have a multispectral camera that is capturing a video sequence, and uh, we we're going to have the spatial information plus we're going to have time and spectral uh, data. Uh, we have applied this this technique in a, in a recent uh, application very successfully. Okay, so. Uh, with these uh, correlated multimodality images, we're going to have a lot of information of the sample. And the idea here is how to get the most of this information and mainly for classification. So uh, the classification uh, could be at two uh, levels or two scales could be over the complete image or can be at pixel level. Depending on the application, we will apply one um, uh, perspective or, or the other. But in both cases, the idea is we want to do this classification with reduced reduce complexity and we have high accuracy. How can we do that? I mean, that, that's the research problem that we have addressed in our research group. So we uh, propose this general methodology. And uh, so we have the correlated images, then we do some pre-processing that is uh, that could be um, filtering or maybe normalization. And after that, we do the uh, linear and nonlinear mixing. Why we do, uh, why we apply this thing? Well, the idea is by linear or nonlinear mixing, we are decoupling the spatial and the rest of the information that it could be spectral, time, or morphological. Once we have this decoupling, we can do the classification. In a group, we have developed pretty efficient techniques for this linear and nonlinear mixing. And I'm going to explain a little bit uh, further in the presentation these techniques. We could do eventually after the mixing, we could do the classification. But what we observe is that sometimes uh, this classification is not robust. So to add robustness to the classification, we rely on artificial intelligence. And in artificial intelligence, we're going to apply mainly machine learning or deep learning. And in our results, this is a very successful combination. And finally, we have the performance evaluation. This is the general uh, strategy or the general methodology that we that we have applied so far with uh, pretty good results. And. Uh, the cornerstone of this is what we call this linear and nonlinear mixing. And let me explain a little bit more about uh, the problem. In, in, in this linear and nonlinear mixing, in the standard approach, or what is called the supervised formulation, we are given a database of some physical properties. And we also have 
what is called the end members or the basic components of the phenomena. And the idea is we want to estimate the abundances of these end members at each spatial point or at each pixel. And these contributions uh, should uh, or must uh, reproduce the information that we're measuring. And we're following a linear or a nonlinear mixing model. Um, a simple explanation of this procedure could be related to how uh, uh, can we obtain color in an image. In an image, um, the color is obtained by combining uh, red, uh, green, uh, and blue in certain contributions to reproduce a specific color. In this case, red, uh, green, and blue would be the end members. And the contribution to get, for example, the brown color are the abundances. This is the standard formulation when we know the end members. A more interesting approach and more challenging also is we want to estimate jointly end members and abundances from the data set. And this is what is called the unsupervised or the blind approach. Our contributions have been on the more challenging problem, on the blind approach. And let me just explain the methodology. In linear mixing, this is a pictorial view of, of, of the approach and for Enfling dataset. We have the measurement, uh, the measurement uh, matrix, and we want to decompose in the in members and the abundances. The abundances are going to contain the spatial information and the end members, in this case, the time profiles. The, it, this is, has some resemblance to the problem of non-negative matrix factorization. And this is, a, is a, another approach that is similar to our schemes. This is another pictorial view of the application of hyperspectral imaging where we have the hyperspectral image and at each spatial uh, point, we have the uh, spectral response. And what we do uh, uh, after the linear mixing is that we obtain the end members that are the basic, in this case, spectral components. And these basic spectral components are combined uh, by the abundance to reproduce the measurements that we have here. OK. What is the mathematical formulation of the problem that we are addressing? Well, let's assume that we have a data set of some measurements, and each measurement is a vector. OK. One step that is crucial or that has been pretty important in our development is we have to do a normalization of the measurements. Especially, we scale it to, sum to, to, to make them sum to one. This is, is important uh, to avoid numerical problems. Once we have this normalization, the idea is I want to represent each measurement, each vector that uh, we are obtaining from the physical world as a combination, a linear combination of abundances and end member vectors. OK. You can use a matrix notation for this. In this case, P contains all the end members. Each column is an end member. And I have here the abundance vector. We do that for each pixel in the image. And also, we have to include some uncertainty. And we're assuming that this is a random noise that is also affecting our information. OK, so what is the goal? What is the objective? In this case, we want to estimate n members in the blind formulation over the whole data, data set. I mean, we're assuming that the n members are the same in the whole data set. That's important. And the abundances are estimated per pixel or per special point. Okay. 
This is what is called an inverse problem in engineering. It's a challenging problem. It's a new post problem, mathematical problem. So we have to formulate it in a certain way that we can obtain a solution. A solution. How we approach it? Well, we formulate it as an optimization problem where we estimate abundances and in members. And for that, we propose a certain cost function. This cost function uh, is normalized, as you see here. This term is a normalization term. This is also normalization. Um, and we have three terms. The first term is an estimation error. Uh, we want to reduce the estimation error, of course. We want to maximize the entropy of the abundances. Let me explain a little bit about this term. The abundances are the contribution of the M members per pixel. We know or we have defined the abundances as uh, uh, limited to the interval 0 to 1. So in some cases, we want the abundances to go to the limits, close to 0 and close to 1, especially if we want address classification. So we want to increase the entropy of the, of the abundances. Uh, so we add the term, and we finally add another term related to the difference between or among, pardon, sorry, um, and members. So we have three terms. And the problem is, you see here, we have a term that incorporates a multiplication of the free variables. So this makes the problem difficult to solve. How to approach it? Well, we're going to apply what is called alternated least squares. What it means is we fix abundance, we estimate the members, and then we fix the members, estimate the abundances. And it, at each step, we have a constrained quadratic optimization problem. We have developed um, an algorithm for this, and it's called extended blind and member and abundance extraction method. All the coding was implemented in MATLAB. And um, if anybody is interested, we can share it. I mean, we have actually a GitHub uh, site uh, to, to share the information or the coding. And this is the block diagram. In yellow, you can see the alternated list of squares. There is an iteration that we perform until, until convergence or until a maximum number of iterations. Um, we, as I was mentioned, estimate abundances while we fix the numbers, and then we do the opposite. Estimate the numbers while fixing abundances. Um, this uh, algorithm, in our case, um, show very uh, nice properties of convergence. But um, it's always be the same. I mean, it's always going to converge. That's a natural question. And the thing here is the cost function is quadratic. At each step uh, of the iteration, we solve a constrained quadratic problem. Uh, constrained uh, quadratic problem. So there is a solution, a closed solution. So it's, it's feasible that uh, this algorithm will converge. We're going to converge to a global minimum. Natural question. That is an issue. <laughs> Actually, that's an issue. Uh, the thing is, uh, it depends a lot on the initial and member matrix. It depends on where you start in this iteration. So we have um, proposed several uh, initial and member and member matrices in our in our work, and in depending on the type of application, the recommendation is to follow certain uh, initialization, but eventually converge converge to a good solution, but depends on the application. That's that's an important point. Well, this is the linear scheme. Let me uh, uh, mention what we have done about the nonlinear model. Well, 
if you review uh, the literature, especially in remote remote sensing, you're going to find different nonlinear mixing models. We have what is called the fan model. We have the bilinear uh, model. We have different flavors of model. For our research, we selected what is called the multilinear mixing model. Uh, it was proposed in around 2013. And um, the nice thing about this uh, nonlinear mixing model is that it includes uh, just a single parameter to quantify the nonlinear interaction. So in this um, formulation, our measurement is again a vector. And then we have this D uh, term that is a nonlinear interaction level that has to be calculated at each pixel of the, of the image. And this nonlinear pattern is related to this Hadamard product. Hadamard product means that uh, the multiplication is by uh, the, each uh, component of the vector. So, in terms of uh, synthesis, the objective is as before, we want to estimate the N members over the whole database, but now at each uh, spatial point, we have abundance, but we have no linear interaction loads. So the complexity comes here. As you see, we have a term that involves the multiplication of the three variables that we want to estimate. So this is by far a more challenging inverse problem compared to the linear one. How can we approach it? Well, we're going to follow the same idea. We're going to propose uh, an optimization problem for the synthesis. And the nice thing is we can follow the same philosophy of the linear perspective in terms of there is a um, term related to the error. There's another term related to the entropy here, and there's another term related to the uh, difference uh, among the members. So the philosophies, the, the, the synthesis philosophy is exactly the same, just we're changing the, um, the error term that estimation error term. And we have here the main problem, that is the multiplication of the three, three variables. How can we solve it? I mean, if, if you follow an engineering perspective, okay, we have the problem, how can we solve it? Well, once more, the formulation is quadratic. And it's constrained. We have some constraints during the optimization, but it's quadratic. So it's a nice thing. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to apply what is called cyclic coordinate descendant grid. Mainly, we're going to fix one variable, two variables, and then we optimize for the third one. We do the same. We fix another two, we solve for the third one, and we, we go in, in, in that direction. The, the algorithm that we have developed is called nonlinear extended blind and membrane abundance extraction. This is just a, a recent work. It, it was published, it's going to be published in December of this year. And now the block diagram of the implementation is more involved. Of course. We have two iterations, one, one here, and we have another one here. Um, Eventually, all the optimizations um, are quadratic, as I was mentioned. Uh, so um, the only thing that is different in this uh, scheme is how to estimate the end members. In this formulation, we cannot have a closed solution for the end members matrix at each step of the iteration. And that's a big challenge. So to, to solve the problem, we uh, propose uh, um, here a gradient descent, but not a simple gradient descent, a gradient descent with an adaptive uh, step. So we, we carry out this adaptive step and eventually 
we evaluated uh, convergence with uh, good results. And that would be the natural question. What about the convergence? Once more, I mean, uh, it, it's affected by the initial end member, end member matrix, of course. But we notice that uh, there's another crucial step that is the scaling at the beginning of the algorithm. We need to scale all the measurements to some to one and that normalization at robustness. And that's also um, is, is pretty important, pretty important step in, 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 in the algorithm. Well, we can do this linear and nonlinear on mixing for classification. OK, we can do that. Uh, we have the abundances, we have the members. Can we do the classification directly, say, from the abundances? We tried that approach, but we noticed, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, it could be it, it could be an issue of the robustness. So, what is could be an alternative uh, an alternative approach? Well, we could rely on artificial intelligence. Okay, artificial intelligence is uh, the science and and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. And um, we are relying on machine and deep learning for for the classification step. Okay. Um, both techniques are focusing on learning representation from the data. Actually, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. And just a brief overview in machine learning, we have data, we have an answers, and then we want to come up with what. And we have two basic problems in machine learning, classification and regression. We are addressing only classification in, in our work so far. And uh, we have a pretty developed uh, machinery of tools in, in machine learning, uh, different uh, algorithms. We have been pretty successful in the past. Um, naive based algorithm, decision trees, support, support vector machines, neural networks, the shallow ones, random forest, gradient boosting machines. In our research, we have used uh, mainly support vector machines and recently gradient boosting machines with, with pretty good results. Well, uh, what about uh, uh, deep learning? Uh, in deep learning, we are learning um, with a structure of a neural network. And basically, we have different layers in the network. And the idea is in this, in this layer, we increasingly meaningful representation to achieve the classification. This is just an illustration of the classification of uh, image that's related to a digit that you handwritten digit, where we, as we increase in the layers, we see that we have the representations as just a picture of it. But we are using then machine learning and deep learning in uh, our research. OK. Um, what we have done so far is we have developed the tools, we have developed the algorithms, we have developed a methodology. And now I'm going to show you some successful application examples that we have carried out with our colleagues from uh, international institutions. The first one that I want to, to, to show you is um, the classification of uh, tumor tissue in a craniotomy uh, procedure by hyperspectral imaging. And uh, in this case, the classification that we want to achieve is on the pixel scale. This is a uh, this this work is a collaboration with the Universidad de las Palmas in Gran Canaria, and um, we are relying on hyperspectral imaging, and uh, we are using the range 400 to 1,000 nanometers, and we have 826 bands in our in our images. 
the idea is um, you have images in vivo images during a craniotomy surgical procedure and you want to label the pixels in four classes normal tissue two more tissue hypermuscularized tissue and background to guide our process we uh, we have some very few pixels that are manually labeled that is why the, the approach is called semi-supervised. Okay. So we have some uh, labeled pixels, not all. And this depends on, on the image. We, the number of labeled pixels changes. This is uh, a representation uh, of, of the images that we are using. We have the spatial dimension here. And then we have the spectral dimension that is goes from 400 to 1000 nanometers. And at each pixel, we have this spectral response of the tissue. OK. Um, this application, in this application, we uh, use four hyperspectral images. And uh, in this, row, you can see the label pixels that we start with. Um, you have also the dimension of the, of the image. Each image is different in the spatial domain. The number of spectral bands is always the same, 826. And uh, the number of labeled pixels is different, as you can see here. And the idea is we want to X, classify the whole image, I mean, just departing from these few pixels that are labeled. You can see here uh, 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 at the top some tissue that is circled in yellow. This um, part here is manually um, labeled by the physician as tumor. So we expect in everything that is um, here enclosed by the yellow line to have a tumor tissue. Well, what is the methodology that, that, that we use? Uh, we have first the linear missing, and then we have the machine learning stage. So um, we identify end members with the label pixels. Um, these end members are related to the four classes, normal, two more, hypervascularized, and background. And once we have that, uh, we use the abundances. Since we, have, we want to do the classification at pixel level, we are going to use the abundance as a parameter for classification. And we tested four techniques. Neural network, support vector machine, and random forest. And uh, we do the concentration map and we compare, we check the performance just with the label pixels. Okay. These are the results for the uh, six images. Uh, just for the support vector machine, and just if we do just linear mixing, just like that, without the, the machine learning approach. Um, the coding for the color here is in green, we have the normal tissue. In black, we have what is called background. Uh, that is related to bone and uh, some other uh, uh, types of, of, of tissue. The red one is tumor, and the blue one is hypervascularized tissue. What was the performance? Uh, we have here the six images. And uh, we didn't have a clear winner. I mean, in some cases, as in this one, the best one is support vector machine. 
bond, but in other case, uh, we just use just simple linear mixing. And uh, in this case, we have a support vector machine. And um, we could have also here the random forest. I mean, we didn't have a window, but eventually uh, we didn't try it in, 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 in this work, but we could use an ensemble of machine learning techniques to improve the accuracy. And that's that's one thing that we can do. Let me just go to the next classification, uh, the, the application example. In this case, it's different. We have histopathology samples, and we want to classify it, but the whole image. The whole image is uh, certain tissue that we have slide of the tissue, and that slide of tissue is labeled as tumor or no tumor. We have 13 patients where we uh, use uh, the, the tissue. Some of them have uh, two classes, tumor and non-tumor, or tumor and healthy, okay? And uh, we, we did some partition to have a balanced condition for the classification. This is uh, once more a collaboration with uh, Universidad de Las Palmas. In this case, we have 13 histological samples, and the tumor is a glioblastoma tumor, a very aggressive tumor. And the idea here is the tumor is going to modify the texture of the image. Uh, all the labels of the, sorry, all the uh, images were labeled by a pathologist as tumor or non-tumor. Um, we have again uh, images in the range uh, 400 to 1000 nanometers with um, 826 bands, and we have a binary classification problem. Um, these, these are the, the type of images that we are uh, dealing with. This is tumor and non-tumor. And remember that in histopathology, um, the images uh, include some uh, uh, processing, to highlight in, in color the texture. And this is the final pipeline of the processing. Um, we did some uh, pre-processing, uh, calibration, band, redu band reduction in data partition, and then we did the mixing. In this case, uh, the images, uh, sometimes they have this white part Okay, like this, whereas there's no tissue. So what we found is that in, in some cases, and we have we could have an end member that is pretty flat, like this yellow one, that is related to this lack of tissue in the image. And it's just white that is just flat. Mm -hmm. So what we did as a, um, a step uh, four is to remove that, um, uh, and number because it's related to something um, that um, doesn't have information on the tissue. Then we do the uh, we use the end members for the classification. We put together all the end members, and uh, once we have that, the classification is done by an ensemble of neural networks. In this case, we have uh, what is called level zero neural network, and we have a level one also. And we perform the classification results. This is the chain. Um, the level um, one network contains three level zero, and we use then members for uh, as features for the classification. In, uh, we just recently submitted this work uh, to a journal, but I, I can share with you all the details of the neural networks and how we did the training and the validation steps. It's pretty interesting. The result, the result here um, for the 13 patients, 
we measure accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, precision, and F1 score. And um, um, for this same database, we have two uh, previous papers that have addressed the same database. In all cases, we found that uh, our approach was more efficient in complexity and improved in it had, it had improved accuracy. So it was pretty encouraging that. And uh, to to close the the um, the talk, let me uh, describe uh, some different applications. The idea is we want to classify defects in a material, and uh, for that we use what is called long pulse thermography, and we do that at a pixel scale. This is a collaboration uh, with uh, uh, institute that's called STIMA in Bari, Italy, with uh, Professor Roberto Marani. And we measured uh, the temperature after a heat excitation in the sample. This is not invasive, this is non contact. And uh, uh, to do the recording, we have an infrared camera. Uh, what we do is uh, we measure the temperature information and we construct what is called thermal contrast. These thermal contrasts are unmixed and they are used for the classification. I'm going to describe a little bit more uh, for, uh, in the next slide. Well, what are composites? Composites are materials where we have maybe different layers of, of materials. And, and they are arranged to increase physical and mechanical properties. This is especially useful in aerospace. And that's the, 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 target, the target industry of this application. Uh, the, and the point is we can find eventually uh, defects, local cracks on soldering. Uh, and this is pretty important to do it uh, as in a simple way as possible. To carry out our, uh, our evaluation, we uh, have a, a platform, a synthetic material, where we have arranged uh, these special uh, holes where we have defects. And we have uh, four classes, defect one, defect two, defect three, and we have training test uh, regions for that. Um, class zero is, is the healthy material, what is called sound region. Class one is, is, is small thickness in the material, where you have more abrupt changes in temperature. You have mid thickness, class two, and the third one is high thickness. It's more challenging to um, get the classification right for class three, okay, because it's getting closer to the normal thickness of the material. Here you can see in, in, in this uh, plot, this is the temperature, and we have the heating part here by the lamp. And once we switch off the lamp, then becomes the temperature or the cooling, the temperature decreasing. Class zero is the blue one. As you can see, the blue one is very um, decreasing monotonically. And this is what you expect in a normal material. But in the class one, two, and three, we have different patterns. Okay, it's more abrupt from for class one, is what we expect. So uh, to do the the the, um, the mixing, what we did is we did not process the temperature directly. We we evaluated the contrast, and that is we subtract the mean response of the class zero to all the temperature traces. So in this contrast uh, computation, class zero is flat, close to zero, I mean zero response, and we have magnified the difference between class three, class two, and class one. Okay. So the, the, the approach would be we want to use the abundances by linear mixing of this normalized temperature contrast 
And these are the features for uh, support vector machine classification. These are the, the, the results. I'm gonna go very, very fast because we are almost at the limit time. Um, this is for foreign members and for seven. In this case, we have to increase the number of N members in our mixing strategy to get better results. This is the result for four. And this is for seven. And for seven, you see, there is a much, much better accuracy, balance, accuracy, precision, and recall compared to four, four N members. Once more, we compare these results with state of the art. We show that we have improvements, and that's one of the main contributions. This, this work is going to be published next year, but it's already approved, and you can check the paper. I can share it with you without a problem. OK, so uh, I must conclude my, 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 my talk. I have showed you um, classification scheme for correlated multimodality images. And it's a pretty standard general methodology that we call hybrid because we combine a first stage of linear and nonlinear remixing with artificial intelligence. One of the main motivation of, of, of our scheme is to have uh, efficient, uh, computationally efficient uh, classification techniques. And um, so we, we reduce the computational burden of classical deep learning schemes, for example, with convolutional neural networks. Uh, so linear and nonlinear mixing provides a feature, uh, a feature extraction step that is less time consuming that, uh, that uh, compared with deep learning. And um, the classification performance, it, it was always improved in our evaluations with the, the state of the art. So this is, uh, was pretty important for us. And um, all the implementations uh, were carried out in MATLAB. So we are moving now to implement everything in Python. I think almost we have already have good uh, good uh, implementations in pilot in Python, sorry. And um, this uh, the main motivation is to have an open access platform for the evaluation and also to use some of the tools uh, that uh, Python has as scikit-learn or Keras or TensorFlow. And we want to also investigate uh, deep, uh, more advanced deep neural architectures as vision transformers in our research. And uh, we, we are uh, right now do, doing that, actually. I want to acknowledge uh, the funding that, uh, that uh, I have uh, for these collaborations, um, and the CONACYT, the Texas A&M funding, <clears throat> Comexus Fulbright and uh, Basic Science uh, Grant from Conacyt. I want to thank you all for uh, for uh, hearing my uh, uh, staring in my presentation. Um, you can um, send me an email if you want uh, uh, the scripts or the of the files for the implementation. I have no problem in sharing with you, and you can check and. Um, this uh, my site in the search gate of okay. science for more information about my 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 research. And uh, thank you very much. I don't know if, if you have a question. Thank you. Thank you. Any question? What is the dimension in the images? Uh, in row, what is the dimension in column? And principal, what is the dimension over the T axis? Because you can okay. use, you can use, you can use 
a dimensional the reduction no? or the C axis, maybe it's a PCA or another vector. Possible. Yeah. Or no? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let, let me just show you that information in in one of the examples. I have it there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in 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 this case, um, the first image it, it was four hundred and sixty pixels by five hundred and forty nine. And I have uh, 826 expected bands. So the the um, the spectral dimension was uh, 826. And you have here the other dimension for the rest of the images. Okay. But what you can use uh, dimensionality reduction over the C axis, and maybe you can use. PCA. Yeah, you're right. I mean, PCA, ECA, uh, uh, non negative matrix factorization are alternative. However, our approach includes some restrictions in this decomposition. First one is that the information is always positive, and all the components of the vector are positive. And also, we have the restriction that the abundances are restricted to the zero one interval, and also the numbers are normalized. This changes the results compared to PCA with ICA or with non negative metric factorization. We have a more physical um, interpretation of the results by our approach. Uh, what, what happened with the noise in the, in the, axis, in the C axis? Yeah, we, we, we can have, and of course, we can have a noise. Is, uh, for example, if we have hyperspectral imaging, we, ha we could have um, noise related to the spectral dimension. What we do is we do them some reduction in the number of bands to cancel this effect. Uh, so instead of using these 826 bands, uh, we reduce uh, to maybe 200 bands uh, to uh, to cancel some of the of the uh, the noise. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Daniel, for your presentation. Uh, there is some another question. And the people in the virtual world, you can write in the chat or something like that. No. Daniel, just yeah. a small question. I, uh -huh. I, I, I see that this is your combination of a mixed uh, the linear and non-linear mathematical approach mm -hmm. plus uh, the arti uh, artificial intelligence. It makes a, it's, it's great. What uh, you mentioned is that the, you include the artificial intelligence due to the robustness problem. Mm -hmm. Can you explain me a little bit more about the robustness problem with the first approach? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, for example, um, sometimes maybe in in, in the um, in the data set, you know that. Um, you are expecting maybe foreign members. But eventually, in, you have some extra numbers that you didn't quantify, and you need to increase the size of the end members uh, set. In, in that case, it's not straightforward to identify which ab abundances are related to each class. So we let the artificial intelligence scheme to do that for you. In, in this way, you have robust results, because if you try to do it by yourself, maybe you don't capture the, um, the right idea. So you, you let the you let, uh, use learning for that. I understand. Yeah. And from the uh, control theory point of view, it, this mm -hmm. uh, is a 
complex problem mathematically. Uh, yeah. The mathematical analysis. Of, okay. So it's interesting. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you don't have uh, more any questions, I. Yeah, Gerardo. Okay. Bye. I have a question, Daniel. Uh, yeah. yeah. In your presentation, I was thinking about uh, your mixing of techniques, uh, technology, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And because uh, you are uh, focused on biomedical applications, right. I was thinking of, on the recent uh, images. Uh, uh, obtained from the uh, James Webb telescope because, uh, I, in my opinion, are, there are some similarities for astronomical uh, applications. Uh, yeah, you're right. About that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, thinking, what the what uh, kind of techniques are using the astronomers? I, I mean. One of the, this, uh, these techniques started with in the field of remote sensing. And in remote sensing, you talk about um, satellites. So um, the, the first applications was related in, in, in satellites to identify um, the components of a land region. And I've seen that they apply also to astronomy. I, I'm not quite familiar with the applications, but I've seen the papers where they use also hyperspectral images in astronomy. But this this is another application field, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gerardo. Um, thank you, Daniel, again for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel, thank you for uh, contributing to this conference. See you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, this. Uh,